So, what exactly is a virus? What we often hear is that they are minute particles that float in the air and often cause disease. But is that actually true? A virus is extremely small, as you know, so you're not going to find them in the air. To be able to see a virus, you'll need a microscope. And I am talking about an electron microscope specifically. Before you view like a biopsy sample under the electron microscope, you'll need to uh, implement some types of preparation procedures, pre preparation methods, if you will. Uh, and the reason, behind, the reason for that is because the electron microscope is just amazingly powerful. I mean, it can produce electron beams up to 150 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the preparation methods. Uh, first, you do something that is called fixation. Well, uh, with fixation, you'll put the tissue inside of a chemical fixative. So uh, the fixative could be formalin, it could be uh, glutaraldehyde. We'll discuss the substances later. But the reason behind this uh, method is to preserve the structure uh, of the tissue when it's been removed. Uh, next thing you'll do is a, a method that's called dehydration. So you'll put the tissue inside, uh, inside of many baths of alcohol. Uh, this could be ethanol or acetone. And the reason for this is to uh, drain the tissue, to remove all of the water from the tissue. And uh, subsequently you do something that is called embedding. Uh, what that means is you put uh, the tissue inside of a small mold and you fill the mold with some type of uh, resin or uh, wax. So you're to you mo mostly will use uh, paraffin wax or epoxy resin and you fill then let's say uh, paraffin wax. You fill the mold with the paraffin wax and then you put a cassette on top of it. And then you completely fill the cassette with the paraffin wax. Uh, then you'll put it on a, uh, some type of area which uh, is specifically uh, designed for cooling. So uh, you can put it there to let it cool. And um, when it's completely cooled, it will be uh, hardened. And when it's completely hardened, it is ready for cutting, slicing. So uh, when, you, uh, when you slice the tissue, you... Um, uh, you slice it into very thin uh, pieces. And I am talking about very thin pieces. Uh, well, the next thing you'll do is a process that's called staining. So with staining, you'll um, stain the tissue with some type of... Um, some type of heavy metal. This, this could be like uh, urinal acetate. Uh, this is another name for uranium, or you'll use lead to stain the tissue. And this is so you can have more contrast uh, when you're viewing the tissue. So these are done specifically to have, uh, to, to be able to view things better adequately under the, uh, under the electron microscope. So the first thing you'll notice is that these are actually highly influential preparation methods. Uh, when we're talking about biological samples, I mean, if we just look at the substances that are used uh, for conducting these types of preparations, we'll see a whole range of um, anomalies. I mean, um, if we take formalin, for example, formalin is another name for formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen and a known human neurotoxin. A neurotoxin being a uh, something that is toxic to the brain. Um, we mentioned glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is specifically dangerous for the uh, for the gastrointestinal tract and for the lungs. Uh, osmium tetraoxide is no exception to that either. Osmium tetraoxide is known for causing pulmonary edemia inside uh, of humans. Uh, and did you remember those alcohol baths that we mentioned? Like the baths of ethanol and acetone. Ethanol, which could cause severe uh, liver damage, uh, hepatotoxicity, and uh, acetone, which is known for causing severe damage to the kidneys, uh, the lungs 
and the brain specifically. And uh, things indeed that stood out for most people were the was the use of the highly um, uh, the very dangerous heavy metals, uranium and lead. I mean, what kind of effects would those uh, uh, minerals have on a biological sample, which are known for causing severe damage to humans? And, of course, we have the paraffin and the epoxy. And um, the paraffin, yes, it is indeed the same paraffin that is uh, that originates from petroleum. Petrol, the same petrol we use as a fuel. And epoxy, it is the same epoxy that we use for making all these shiny floors everywhere. <laughs> and... Um, this all begs the question should uh, how do these uh, how do the results of these preparation methods uh, so what you see under the electron microscope when all the preparation methods have been uh, completed uh, when they all have been uh, conducted uh, the results of it what you see under the uh, under the electron microscope how do these results relate to your living body so what happens inside of your body um, in comparison to what they see in this piece of poisoned tissue the if if a t if a sample is this uh, uh edited if you will it is inevitable that you have a whole nother environment in front of you an artificial environment. A gentleman that was quite concerned about this during his career was a prestigious scientist called Dr. Harold Hillman. Biologists have shown little interest in the effects that the procedures they use have on the structure and chemistry of the tissues they are studying. This has led them into the study of many artifacts and distortions of the chemistry of the living systems. An artifact is an artificial structure that cannot be found within tissue when it's still inside of the living body. So something that is only present as a result of these highly influential preparation methods and not because it was in the body when you removed the tissue. So another thing that deserves a lot of attention but doesn't receive it is when you remove a piece of tissue, be it blood or mucus for that matter, you're removing it from its natural environment, a living human body. It once was an integral part of a intact of an intact living structure, but now it isn't a part of a whole anymore, if you will, because now you've removed it and it is now dead. The things you see in front of you are dead, rotting material. So what kind of... Ex what kind of conclusions do you expect to make out of it when you're trying to learn something about a living human body? Understanding the body in its living state is very complex. Scientists could remove something from the body and visually inspect it in vitro. However, they cannot see what happens inside of your body when it's in the body, in vivo. So that begs the question, should we take the results of these methods seriously, taking into account that they cannot even prove that such a virus actually causes disease? Well, the things they can't do is make theories about them. So because they see uh, vast amounts of cells die inside of this tissue sample under the electron microscope, um, they say that the viruses are the cause of um, serious conditions because uh, the viruses kill cells in vast amounts. But cell death is not adequate as an explanation for serious conditions like polio, uh, for example, because medical science also acknowledges that cell death is a perfectly normal part of the living human body. We also know this to be apoptosis, where billions of cells die every single day.
In other words, medical science acknowledges that cell death is a perfectly normal part of life, whilst at the same time claiming that it is responsible for severe damage to the central nervous system, to the lungs, etc. It seems to me like they're contradicting themselves. Intriguingly enough, the definition doesn't describe a virus as an organism, so a living thing, but it describes it as a particle, meaning a part of something else. So what exactly are they a part of? They are a part of cells. When tissue has been fixed, when it has been dehydrated, embedded, stained, when it has been bombarded by electron beams, cells break down into many particles. And these particles they call viruses, and they are blamed for the death of the cell. Now, the things they see can never be seen within a living human body, but only within this tiny, rotting piece of poison tissue. So that is why I describe these particles or viruses as artifacts, artifacts of these preparation methods. So viruses are not organisms, they are non-living because they do not possess the characteristics to be described as an organism. One of those characteristics was described by Dr. Lynn Margulis, a renowned biologist and a former member of the National Academy of Sciences. Metabolism, the never-ending chemistry of self-maintenance, is an essential feature of life. Viruses miss this. So I say that we shouldn't take everything seriously, that we only get to see within a tiny piece of rotting poison tissue under a microscope with very strict laboratory conditions. Now, of course, you're going down a very controversial route, but these are things that we can discuss openly and freely without the need for a general consensus, meaning that we can form all of our researches, all of our investigations uh, to what has been mutually discussed somewhere by who knows, and that we come to accept and take what has been agreed by those people as the explanation for the phenomenon in question. And that is the definition of a consensus. It is just a euphemism for belief, which has nothing to do with real science. Real science does, however, have everything to do with disproving theories, like the germ theory, for as long as it takes until we get to the real explanation for the phenomenon in question. Such as, how do we get diseased? What is the nature behind diseased? What is disease? Which is something we're going to talk about a lot here. So, no, you don't have to wear a face mask that will only restrict your breathing, which also bears severe consequences. Take the brain, for example. We know that the brain is very sensitive to oxygen deprivation. As a result of the lack of oxygen in the brain, neurons die within minutes, resulting in imminent brain damage sooner or later. And the reason that it's significant is because neurons do not regenerate after a certain age. What is gone is now gone. Another reason why face masks are dangerous will evidently involve the lungs. Because we cannot take in a full breath, so to speak, we compensate by breathing in harder, and as a result we breathe in the mask's fibres with it, which will inevitably end up in your lungs. And have I mentioned that the surgical masks specifically are made of polymers? It wouldn't be very healthy to have that sort of material hanging around in there. And think of how stuffy your body gets with all the carbon dioxide you keep inside. And oftentimes you hear things like, oh, but it goes through it. Yeah. Sure, so face masks are a gigantic contraindication. In other words, they do more harm than good. And certainly not injecting dubious vaccines into your body that are still in their safety trials. In the future, we will discuss more subjects like bacteria, the history of vaccination, the real causes of known diseases, real health, and much more. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.